Good morning. My name is Stephen Kent, and I'm co-chair of the program committee. And this morning, I have the distinct honor of introducing the first of our keynote speakers, John Crane from the University College Cork, Ireland, who's going to talk on mind-altering microbes, role of the gut microbiota on brain and behavior. I have to say it's a distinct pleasure for me to introduce John because 16 years ago, when John was a PhD student, um, Um, at National University of Ireland in Galway. He spent a year at Melbourne, in Melbourne, Australia, and John and I were flatmates. Since then, I have to say John's career has really skyrocketed. Um, so he finished his, his PhD at the Univer National University of Ireland, then did a couple of postdocs, first at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, then at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla in California. From there, he then took a position as a lab head at Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research in Basel, Switzerland. He joined University College Cork in 2005 as a senior lecturer, if I recall, and has now progressed to the point where he is professor and chair of the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience. John has over 190 peer-reviewed articles and chapters in some very impressive journals, including PNAS, Neuron, Nature Reviews, Neuroscience, Molecular Psychiatry, Biological Psychiatry, and the list goes on. He has an H index of 45, which I believe is greater than his age. Um, he's senior editor for neuropharmacology and nutritional neuroscience. He received the inaugural University College Cork Researcher of the Year Award in 2012. Previous to this, he'd received the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology, or the ECNP, Fellowship Award, the Wyeth Psychopharmacology Award from the British Association of Psychopharmacology, the Young Scientist Award from the European Behavioral Pharmacology Society, and this year, he's been awarded the University of Utrecht Award for Excellence in Pharmaceutical Research. There are other things I could add, but I think that's sufficient to give you an indication of how prestigious John's career has been. John. Well, it's a real honor to be here, and thanks, Steve, and the program committee for uh, in, in, uh, inviting me. Uh, and especially an honor to be here in, 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 in Ireland uh, to give this uh, lecture. And. Um, I'm going to take you on a little journey that, we, that, we, that we've been on over the last number of years, trying to unravel um, a kind of a, an area that hasn't been very well explored. And, and uh, it's something that if, if someone said to me six years ago, I'd be publishing papers with the word microbiota in the title, I would have laughed at them. But uh, I hope to convince you over the next 45 minutes or so that uh, this is a, a very interesting area that, that may impact all of your research and that maybe uh, we need to focus a little bit more on what, uh, in our, uh, what our gut feelings are on, on things. So this is a little geography lesson that I like to always to give. Now, you all met it here, so you all know where Ireland is. Uh, we are probably, as a nation, closer to Boston in mentality than Berlin. But uh, what's very important when you're in Ireland, uh, there's only one thing in terms of the geography uh, to know, and, and that is, uh, this is Cork, where, I, where I'm based, and the rest is not Cork. So uh, it's a little, Cork is a bit of, like, uh, I describe it as the Quebec of Ireland. Uh, it, it, it's very... Uh, self-sufficient. Um, what, what's important to realize is that the uh, disciplines of microbiology and neuroscience have really uh, evolved in modern medical research in, in parallel, they, with very little intersection. But there are, have been some. Of note, over 100 years ago, people were very concerned in terms of syphilis and neurosyphilis and the, the consequences in there. And then in the 1980s and 90s, a lot of effort went in to try and understand the uh, cognitive sequelae of um, HIV infection and, and the molecular mechanisms underpinning that. But other than you know th th these these um, examples, there's been very little uh, ongoing. But that said, there's also a growing appreciation about how the brain and the body can interact. And um, we have this, you know, people are beginning to look at uh, tr treatments and wellness in a holistic fashion and understanding that maybe we could also that treat brain disorders by modulating of other systems. And w what's also important is that we have this um, uh, brain-gut axis. And, and this is the 
way our, our, our um, uh, brain can interact with our gut in a bidirectional fashion through a variety of different pathways. This is just one de description of it through showing the vagus nerve and spinal cord, which are very important uh, uh, sensors of um, uh, uh, homeostasis. And this has been uh, written about since the time of, of um, um, Bernard, uh, Bernard and Darwin and, and Cannon, uh, uh, the, the classical physiologists. Um, my lab is really interested in, in, in understanding how stress, and particularly chronic stress and stress in at distinct uh, junctures in life uh, can impact the whole brain. These are our, our Irish politicians, so uh, this is an international meeting, so you can insert any politician in there, really. Um, but they're particularly annoying a lot of people right now here, so uh, they, 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 they cause the stress. But um, given the current economic climate, uh, austerity looming everywhere, uh, the uh, consequences of stress in everyday life are as uh, 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 clear today as any time. And understanding the molecular basis of this is something that, that, that's informing all of our research. And we have a very distinct and very well worked out and, and studied uh, endocrine axis that, that, that responds to acute and chronic stress, the HPA axis, and then over the last um, uh, 25, 30 years, uh, people have really appreciated the, how the immune system fits into this and that there is this bi-directional communication between the immune system and the brain, uh, and the, the circuits underlying uh, these uh, are, are also being uh, defined. What we can now also add to that in, in some ways is that how stress affects the whole body, because stress, chronic stress, has a whole body effect, and that we can add the gastrointestinal tract, because we know that there is distinct changes induced by stress on motility, on um, re a response to various neuropeptides, on epithelial barrier function, etc. Et and hopefully, uh, as I go through this talk, I'll, you'll see more and more where, where this can play a role. And we also have, have really used this uh, idea in our everyday vernacular language uh, to describe words like being gutted, gutsy, go with your gut, uh, uh, having a gut feeling about uh, things. So so these are all, we already know that, but yet people are still surprised when I talk about the uh, um, gastrointestinal tract in the context of um, uh, anxiety or cognition. Uh, yes, we would use these uh, types of terms all the time. And uh, I, Hans Elie is the father of all stress research and coined the term, and I like this quote from him because he says, it's not stress uh, that kills us, but it's our reaction to it. And more recently, there's a growing appreciation into trying to understand the, the, base, the molecular basis of resilience as well as susceptibility. A lot of people focus on susceptibility, but the cover of Nature covered this the last fall, uh, trying to tease apart uh, why are some people uh, resilient and other people uh, susceptible to different stressors. We've been working on this in different mouse strains. This is a, what we call a normal stressed animal, black six, and a Bob C. And we've been looking at different early life stress protocols and looking at why some of them induce uh, behavioral changes. I won't go into it in detail, but just to point out that it's something that we're quite interested in. And as I mentioned, uh, stress at different stages of life can indu induce different effects. And this is a, um, a, a really nice uh, uh, framework paper by Bruce McEwen and colleagues, which highlights that basically the childhood, there might be a childhood basis for many diseases, not just neuroscience-based uh, diseases, but also the cardiovascular system, immune system, etc. And now as large cohorts are emerging uh, where we, we, people have following them up the, uh, that have had exposure to early life stress, we're beginning to um, uh, really understand more for, uh, w what are the long-term uh, consequences of early life stress. It's also going into the um, basic literature. This is a best-selling book for pregnant mothers in, in, in Ireland and the UK, but it, it talks about chapters like corrosive cortisol and uh, very much trying to understand about the early life of what's going on. And, and, and you, you can see that basically, uh, depending on when stress occurs, whether it's prenatal, postnatal, adolescence, adulthood, or an aging, there may be different effects on different brain areas and uh, different effects on uh, the HPA axis and uh, outcome. So understanding this is what's really informing the field uh, a lot. Um, so I'm a behavioral neuroscientist like most of you here, so um, uh, we rely on animal models to help us to uh, dissect out complex psychopathology. And uh, I like this Gary Larson cartoon a lot, not just because it is an Irish setter, but uh, it, 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 it shows the 
complexity that we're faced with in trying to uh, understand uh, uh, disease, stress-related diseases like depression and anxiety. And we can't just put our uh, rat on a couch and ask it how it's feeling. We have to rely on well-designed behavioral paradigms that, that, that try and uh, extrapolate uh, what's going on in, uh, in, in the human brain. And then we're also faced with an anatomical problem and an evolutionary problem uh, where the uh, mouse brain or rat brain is quite different to the, to the human brain, not just in terms of size, but also in terms of, of uh, uh, structure uh, uh, anatomy. And you can see, for example, the elaboration of the cortex uh, is, is, is much less in, in rodents. And while we, we tend to ignore this at times, it is an important caveat to a lot of what we're, we're doing. But that said, Many of the uh, circuits that are important for uh, e emotion uh, have been conserved, and so we can use rodents uh, with some level of confidence uh, when we're dealing with aspects of reward and, and fear learning through the amygdala, uh, etc. And uh, the relationship between the brain and the gut is probably best studied in the context of satiety. Uh, because food intake, uh, of, you know, w w this is very clear. And, and uh, so a lot of people have been working on this over, over decades, and we've been interested in it more recently and to see why um, or how does stress interact with, uh, with food intake uh, and diet? And why uh, is a conundrum that we're, why do uh, certain people, when they're stressed, eat more, others eat less? Uh, and uh, understanding the interaction between a chronic stress and uh, 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 the different diets. Um, what we did was we fed animals a, um, uh, a high-fat diet for a number of weeks, uh, and then we exposed them to a chronic uh, social uh, defeat stress, which is based on the work of um, uh, Stefan Reber and Inge Neumann, uh, which is basically chronic um, uh, um, uh, defeat combined with overcrowding. Uh, and basically, we looked at their behavior in a variety of uh, tests relevant to uh, antidepressant action or anxiety or reward, um, the four swim tests for uh, antidepressant related behavior like dark box for anxiety. Uh, the female urine sniffing test is a, a really neat test for looking at, uh, uh, that's um, etiologically relevant because it, 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 it basically you look at the amount of time um, a mouse will spend sniffing um, uh, the scent of uh, a female and that it finds rewarding and so you can you can you can uh, uh, do it in an, it, so it doesn't have a caloric aspect like sucrose preference or other things that might interfere and we also look at social interaction and and just briefly just to show you that some of the what we found was some of the behaviors um, that are induced by uh, uh, um, chronic stress, such as social avoidance here. This is uh, our social avoidance induced by stress in low fat and in high fat diet. So there's no interaction, there's no effect of diet on uh, the ability uh, to, for the animals to, be, to have a stress-induced effect in terms of social avoidance. But when we looked at like dark box and looked at other aspects of anxiety, we found that uh, being on a high fat diet protected uh, against this increased anxiety. And moreover, the, 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 we found the same in terms of the behavior in the four swim test. This is the increased immobility induced by stress, and this wasn't present if you're on a high fat diet. However, looking at core reward processes, we found that there still was a reward deficit uh, in animals on a high fat diet. So it's just showing you one of the strategies that we've been looking at, at parsing uh, how the gut and the brain interact with stress. So now I'm going to move on to the gut microbiome, and this is a field that many of you may not be that familiar with. Um, it's just to remind you that you're about 90% of your genes are microbial. It's an important thing to remember, uh, you know, and we focus a lot of our time in, in uh, behavioral neurogenetics trying to tease out what the other 10% are doing, uh, but uh, it's also worthwhile to understand what, uh, what your microbiome is doing. Um, and the microbiome in your gut is playing a key role uh, as protective functions locally, structural functions and metabolic functions, and all of this is being worked out uh, uh, very nicely. Um, your, your Flora will remain relatively constant, and you, you can get a signature of your flora. There's a project ongoing in the U.S. called the American Gut Project at the moment where people can get their microbiome assayed, and, and it's contributing to a, a big, uh, a, a, a big uh, study to try and understand the composition of the American gut. It will fluctuate during illness and with antibiotic treatment, and also is very sensitive to large-scale changes in diet. 
it's really exciting. The whole biological field it was the cover of Nature. Uh, um, was um, the New York Times Sunday New York Times Sunday Magazine a few weeks ago uh, had a whole uh, article on it. And most important to our uh, managers was it made the cover of the Economist, which means there could be money in it, uh, which is the funding agencies are l l like as well. Uh, and this is from last summer. Uh, it, it, it's something that's quite hot. What's important to realize is that you get your microbiome uh, 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 from your mother as you are being born, if you are born uh, uh, per vaginum, uh, so to normal delivery. And uh, it takes about a year for a stable uh, um, uh, microbiome to occur. If you're born by cesarean uh, delivery, you have a different microbiome, and it takes a while, about, uh, quite a while uh, for that to equal, equilibrate with the, uh, that of a, a normal delivery. And this is putting a lot of emphasis now in, on, on trying to understand what the consequences of that in itself are. Um, and it's very important that the, during early life that there are a lot of factors that can uh, influence the composition of the microbiome. I already mentioned naturally antibiotics. Um, again, this is you know widespread use of antibiotics in young kids, uh, at least in, in 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 this part of the world, and I'm sure where, wherever all you guys are from as well. But also. D different aspects of host uh, physiology will impact on it, such as gut structure, uh, genetics, uh, epigenetic role, um, immunity, uh, maturity at birth, uh, and all of these will contribute to what the composition of the microbiota is in the newborn. And then the question is, what happens if you put stress on top of that, and how does it uh, play a role in relation to stress? And so trying to tease out what is the uh, signaling pathways that might be at play here, and how could uh, m microbes in your gut uh, signal to the brain? And I mentioned some of these already, but just to, to reinforce, uh, there could be direct effects on the immune system or on the uh, endocrine system, as well as changes in, uh, in uh, uh, signaling through the, the vagus nerve. Um, and we also know that uh, microbes can produce a lot of the neurotransmitters uh, that, are, that are bioactive, and also uh, metabolites, uh, metabolize into short-chain fatty acids like uh, butyrate. Uh, which can have effects on um, mood, cognition, uh, uh, and pain. And we have different strategies now evolving to try and tease apart how, what is the role of microbiome in different brain functions. And um, these range from um, uh, probiotic studies, which I'll talk about, where you feed animals uh, different bacteria. Also, antibiotic studies, where you try and wipe out a, a lot of the microbes uh, and, and see what, what's happening. Uh, another version of this is using germ-free animals. Now, these are animals that are never colonized with any bacteria. It's not SPF. It's germ-free, completely without microbes. And uh, we're fortunate enough in Cork to have one of these facilities, uh, and this is informing a lot of our work. And then, of course, in, in, a lot of the early work has gone on in terms of infections and how infections can directly affect uh, the brain uh, overall. And then, uh, more recently, and I'll talk briefly about this, is the concept of fecal transplantation, uh, which sounds as yucky as it, 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 it really is, uh, but it is a life-saving um, uh, strategy in certain uh, diseases. So um, going back 40 years in the micro microbiology literature, you can find little glimpses that uh, um, stress can impact the microbiome. In this paper from Tanak, uh, he says basically that stressed mice showed dramatic reductions in populations of lactobacilli. And lactobacilli and bifidobacteria are good bacteria. And so if you're stressed, you get a reduction in that. The, the, these um, observations were largely ignored because the, 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 they, they, were, they weren't in the stress literature. We looked at a um, study of early life stress in the rat. Uh, this, this is a maternally separated animal based on, on, the, on, on the work of uh, Meany and Plotsky and, and others. And basically what we, we did was we separated animals from day 2 to 12 for three hours a day and, and then allowed them to grow up. And a whole phenotype has emerged uh, in these animals. A lot of this has, had been well characterized in terms of um, change in behavior in the open field, in terms of the endocrine system, immune system. We also looked locally in the gut and found that there was increased uh, changes in, in, in uh, transit, 
permeability, inflammation. We also get an increase in abdominal pain, uh, which I'm not showing. But one of the intriguing things we found in this study uh, that Siobhan O'Mahony carried out uh, some years ago was that when we looked at the diversity of, of the microbiota in the gut, and this is using quite crude measures uh, that, that, that were available at the time, we found that if you were subjected to early life stress, that when you grow up, your, your diversity of your gut flora was quite uh, reduced. And Another thing to take home if, about the microbiome is the more diverse it is, the better it is for you in terms of health. Um, and this is probably not that surprising because um, studies from Mike Bailey and Chris Coe had shown earlier in, in, in a monkey model, uh, again, a paper that wasn't really well um, uh, taken up, but, but, but it, it came out in 99 uh, to show that in um, uh, monkeys that had been uh, subjected to early life stress, they also got a reduction in lactobacilli uh, in these animals. So, and, and more recently, uh, Mike Bailey has followed this up on a rodent model of chronic uh, 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 social defeat and looked at the relationship between the relative abundance of specific and, 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 um, microbes, such, uh, but, but they're not the most uh, abundant, but, but just very ones that are, and they show that they're quite changed in stressed animals, and that, that the change in them is, uh, is, is uh, relative to the uh, uh, concentrations of uh, um, cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, in the plasma, so here IL-6 in particular, uh, so that there's an immune modulation effect that's probably mediated through uh, the microbes. So it's in quite an important study. Um, so we have access to these germ-free animals, and basically if you want to know is microbes involved or not, uh, then you just get rid of all the microbes and see what happens. And um, the first study to emerge from this came from Sudo's group in Japan uh, in, in 2004, and it's a really nice paper because what he shows is that if you grow up germ-free and, and you're stressed, so he uh, subjects them to an acute restrained stress, that there's a much exaggerated uh, stress response. ACTH and court response to stress is much exaggerated. And what's really nice in this is that he then started putting back bacteria one by one uh, into these animals and found that if you put back bifidobacteria, this is the, the stress-induced uh, increase in ACTH, and put bifidobacteria in, you can reverse it. So it tells us that the, the, the changes that are induced are not uh, long-lasting. They're long-lasting, but they are open to uh, reversal. And uh, But this paper wasn't that well. Uh, again, it was kind of on its own. Um, about nine years ago, and it took the field a little while to catch on. And then uh, three, four years ago, a number of groups, including our own, uh, started working on, well, if um, germ-free animals have this exaggerated stress response. And we were also thinking, if you stress an animal early in life, it causes a change in microbiota, then maybe the microbiota in early life might be important for brain development. So Sven Pedersen's group in Karolinska, uh, Jane Foster and McMaster and our own, uh, started uh, published, all showing more or less the same thing, which, uh, and all using different behavioral readouts, but all showing the same direction. So it was, it's very nice to see uh, this level of, of convergence. Now, there are some uh, um, mild differences between them, but overall, the, the, the concept has now emerged that there's changes in a variety of neurotransmitters, in, in, in brain wiring, and in uh, behavior, especially in terms of anxiety responses. And this is some of our own data showing, if we look at the expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor uh, in the hippocampus, a key plasticity protein, uh, that it's decreased in um, uh, germ-free animals. We also find this exaggerated stress response, this is the corticosterone response uh, in germ-free animals. So, uh, and then what we did was uh, we looked at whether we could reverse some of these changes. And we looked at serotonin, for example. We got elevations in, in serotonin um, in the hippocampus, which when we recolonized animals post-weaning, so they were grew up, they, they grew to weaning germ-free, and then we put the bacteria back. We couldn't reverse uh, the changes in serotonin. The, um, Anxiety phenotype in the light dark box, which was, is, a, is still a puzzle to us because it's a reduced anxiety, which all of the groups find, yet they're more stressed uh, sensitive. Um, so this is the number of transitions, but also time in the light uh, was increased, and uh, this could be reversed in the recolonized animals. And then we looked at more peripheral markers of related to tryptophan metabolism, the precursor for serotonin. And again, we got elevations in plasma tryptophan, which we could reverse when we recolonize the animal. So it tells us that there are some 
changes that are, uh, uh, require microbiota early in life and that are not reversible and some that are. That are. And what we find, and again, it's, it's still a conundrum for us, is that most of the changes we find are much more prevalent in males than in females. And uh, there is this sex difference uh, at heart. And I'll come back to uh, some musings on that a little while um, towards the end of the talk. Moreover, we're interested in, in uh, one of the disorders of brain-gut dysfunction is, uh, is irritable bowel syndrome, a uh, very common functional bowel disorder. And uh, at the heart of that is, is uh, visceral hypersensitivity or increased abdominal pain. And what we've shown is that uh, mice that are uh, germ-free have an exaggerated uh, pain response, and uh, we can... Uh, uh, reverse that if we reconstitute the animals uh, later on. So it, it, it does tell us that there, there is a, 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 a potential to, 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 for reversal. And then we wanted to look at this in, in, in a more realistic fashion. So we, 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 germ free just give you a kind of a yes, no answer. So we took rats and we, we subjected them to antibiotics early in life. And, and here I'm showing data from vancomycin. We've also done it with a cocktail of other antibiotics. And uh, the good news for all parents is that there was no change in cognition, anxiety, stress, or immune responses in adults uh, that were subjected to antibiotics early in life. However, we did get a very robust increase in visceral pain, just like our germ-free animals. So it's telling us that the microbes early in life are predisposing to uh, the pain pathways, and we're now uh, trying to dissect this out at the level of the spinal cord to see which uh, uh, genes are, are gone awry uh, in this, uh, uh, due to this. And then the flip side of that, of course, is can you use a microbial-based intervention uh, to actually reverse some of these changes? And, uh, and we've shown, and this is just one study, in, in a stress-sensitive rat model, it's the Worcester Kyoto rat, that by uh, intervening with a probiotic uh, bacteria, bifidobacteria infantis, we could increase the threshold for visceral pain and reduce, uh, not hugely, but, but significantly, the amount of pain uh, that, a, that an animal uh, senses. So w w it's telling us that, that you could potentially get therapeutics uh, based around bacteria. This is in line with a French study from a few years ago in Nature Medicine, which also showed that uh, this time it was a lactobacillus acidophilus, uh, that it could increase the uh, concentrations of opiate and cannabinoid receptors uh, locally in the gut, but uh, more importantly and impressively, that it had a... Uh, uh, a visceral analgesic effect, very, very similar to what morphine uh, is doing in this model, so that a bacteria could have a morphine-like uh, effect, and, 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 then, and, then, and this is quite uh, interesting. This led us to think, well, could giving probiotics uh, or potential probiotics in adulthood affect stress-related behaviors and affect uh, uh, um, cognitive uh, function? Uh, we, we did this with a lactobacillus rhamnosus, uh, and we showed that if you stress an animal, you get a hyper... Uh, increase in body temperature. This hyperthermic response is, is blunted by uh, uh, feeding these animals this bacteria. Moreover, when we looked at the elevated plus maze, which is the most widely used uh, test for anxiolytic action, and um, anxiolytic drugs like, like uh, benzodiazepines and Valium will, will, will cause an animal to spend more time out here in the open, what we found was the bacteria uh, had a very uh, similar anxiolytic-like effect, animals treated with the bacteria. And in the four swim test, the animals swim around and, 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 and look for an escape and eventually give up. Antidepressants it will promote this escape-oriented behavior and decrease immobility, and that's exactly what we found with our lactobacillus. And that's behavior, but other things can impact behavior. You know, it, 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 one, one has to be cautious as well. So we also looked at, from a physiological response and, and looked at uh, the stress-induced uh, corticosterone. Uh, and so st we, we got a very nice stress-induced cort response. But in bacteria that have been fed with the lactobacillus, it, this is, is uh, severely blunted. So they, they're more, uh, they don't mount the same stress response. So this was very interesting to us. And, and the next thing was, uh, can we extend this to other uh, behaviors? Um, we looked at uh, fear conditioning, and what we found was there was no effect on the acquisition of, of fear conditioning. Um, but when we looked at, at, at the uh, recall, we were able to show that there was an increased uh, fear learning uh, in these uh, animals that have been fed uh, the, the probiotic. And this is quite robust uh, uh, increase. Moreover, looking at, a, at other bacteria, and just to show whether 
it's one bacteria, do all bacteria do the same thing? No, they don't. And it's, it's going to be very specific to a, a, each bacteria and understanding how a, a specific bacteria is inducing this is going to be a lot of work in the future. This is a, a study where we looked at two bifidobacteria, and, and one is a longum and the other is a brevet, and we looked at their um, uh, uh, spatial working memory on the Barnes maze, and this is a, a, a Test where an animal has to find an escape route and develop a strategy based on spatial cues in the room and the number of errors we can quantify. And animals that have been fed a bifidobacterium longum uh, produce less errors. So it tells us that it's improving their learning. Uh, uh, so th th this was quite exciting for us as well because we're able to dissociate uh, between these different bacteria. And then we'd previously shown uh, work from uh, Leva Debonet uh, had shown that uh, in uh, animals that have been uh, stressed early in life, we get an increase in uh, immobility in the swim test, and this is reversed by citalopram, the antidepressant, but it's also uh, uh, um, attenuated by a bifidobacteria uh, infanta, so again showing us the, the potential for bacteria to induce behavioral effects, but how does it do that? Does it change anything in the brain? And so we started then digging deeper into this, and we've been looking at uh, GABA, because of the anxiety-related phenotype, and we looked at a lot of the GABA-A subunits and the GABA-B subunits, and you get a complex picture, but a very robust and um, uh, reproducible findings that we get uh, decreases in GABA-A, this is alpha-2, uh, in um, the cortical region, CG1 pre prelimbic, infralimbic. Uh, we also get a decrease in the amygdala, in the basal lateral, and central, and we get increases in the dentate gyrus um, uh, and in other parts of the hippocampus. So it's telling Telling us that feeding animals for uh, a number of weeks with a bacteria can actually change the, the levels of uh, GABA receptors in your brain, and that was is probably what's behind the changes in behavior that that's going on. But how do they do it? And we're back to our schematic to in, in, in terms of trying to tease this apart. And uh, I mentioned already the vagus nerve. Well, the vagus nerve is, is very important for sending signals from the whole viscera to the brain and for, 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 for mediating. Um, lots of, uh, 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 of very important aspects of survival. So we performed sub-diaphragmatic uh, vagotomy uh, uh, in, co in collaboration with John Beanstalk's lab at McMaster and uh, looked at whether that would impact um, any of the behavior or uh, neurochemical changes that we found. And this is a busy slide, but just to show you, this is uh, behavior in the open field uh, in, in terms of time in the center. This is gone uh, in big automized animals uh, for swim tests. Here we got a decrease in, in immobility. This is absent in big automized animals. All the changes that we had seen uh, in, um, neuro in, in GABA receptor levels uh, are also absent in big automized animals. So it's telling us for at least this bacteria, in this strain of mouse, uh, the, in, and these behaviors, uh, the, the, an intact vagus uh, is very important. So it kind of reinforces to us a little bit about what happens in Vegas uh, can um, affect uh, a, a, a emotion and reinforces the importance of the vagus nerve uh, for the signaling. Those of you who are aware of the depression literature probably aren't that surprised because vagus nerve stimulation is used uh, in intractable depression um, and in license in the US for this, as well as epilepsy and other um, uh, indications. But it's telling us that, that this is at least one pathway uh, for inducing these effects. Animal studies, great. They give us some, some idea of where it's going, but can, can this field mature into human studies? And, and it's just now at the stage where it, it's beginning to. Again, this is a, a, a study from France uh, from a couple of years ago, which looked at a cocktail of, of two bacteria, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, and they took a, 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 a so it's a non-clinical, these are healthy volunteers, they're co French college students, and uh, they, they looked at them in terms of their normal levels of anxiety and depression, and what they were able to show was that there was a reduction in, in, in the uh, levels of the depression and, and the anxiety in um, uh, these um, uh, subjects that were given uh, this cocktail for a number, number of weeks. So it's telling us that in this healthy population you can get more relaxed if you're taking this bacteria. It's a small study, it, it needs further validation, but, but a really neat study just came out last month uh, from Emmer and Meyer's group uh, and, and Kirsten Tillich in uh, uh, UCLA where they've used uh, 
neuroimaging to uh, look at the impact of feeding. Again, it's healthy volunteers, these, these are, and these are all female. Uh, volunteers. It's a small study, but it's really promising because it's showing that in um, these subjects, given this probiotic uh, in a fermented milk uh, drink uh, for a number of weeks, that you can get a change in the network um, uh, response to an emotional uh, uh, attention task, uh, and, and this is the, um, the, 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 the subject given the drink. And moreover, that if they looked at resting state activity, uh, it's negatively correlated with midbrain activity uh, after the drink. So basically, what they're showing, and, and this is probably all you can really deduce from it, but, but there's changes going on in the neurochemistry in the brain in uh, subjects that have been giving a bacteria. So it's building on the studies we had in, in our mice, which showed that you can change brain uh, chemistry chemistry and receptors, and now we're, we're, it's moved on into uh, a, a, the human uh, domain. The next will be to try this in uh, different populations and different tasks uh, to see whether there can be any therapeutic uh, benefit. Um, Clostridium difficile infection, probably many of you don't know what that is, because it, it, I didn't until relatively recently. It's, it, it's a very serious uh, um, uh, infection that c causes people, to, in, in ca certain cases, to die. And basically, you need to get rid of the, uh, the, the, the bacteria, the Clostridium, out of, and it's very difficult. And one of the ways that people have started looking at is if you can get rid of the microbiota and basically put in a new healthy microbiota into the person, uh, whether that could, uh, it, it, by changing the microbiota through a transplant, uh, you could uh, actually uh, cure. And, and that's the word they use. In the New England uh, Journal of Medicine this January, uh, the the clinical trial was uh, uh, published. It was stopped early because it was so successful. I think something like 87 percent of the, the, the people were cured by getting a fecal microbiota transplant. It's opening up a, a, a whole lot of ethical and other issues uh, in terms of safety, but basically uh, it, people are now beginning to uh, look at this in other domains. Uh, and um, there's a really nice study uh, in, in this paper from Steve Collins and Chemek Burchik from McMaster, um, and it's kind of buried in this paper, but with lots and lots of other interesting studies. But what they did was they, they looked at two mouse strains, uh, what, the NIH Swiss and the Balb sea mouse, and these mice differ on what they do, what they refer to as anxiety behavior. It's it's basically the latency to ju jump down off a off a elevated platform, and so basically the Swiss mice jump very quickly. The Balb mice take their time; they're more nervous, uh, anxious, and. They also looked at the microbiota in these two strains and showed that there was quite a different composition. And then they took the um, uh, NIH Swiss mice and gave it the microbiota from the BAB-C, and all of a sudden it becomes much more anxious. Moreover, they took the microbiota from a uh, NIH Swiss mouse and put it into a BAB-C mouse, and it, and it had a decrease uh, in, in this um, behavior. So this is very interesting and intriguing because it also means that it, people undergoing these clinical fecal transplantations need to be careful about where their donors are coming from, uh, and then in case they are also transferring uh, the potential to uh, affect behavior. And this needs replication in other studies, but it, it's changing our, our, our perception of how this field is, is going. I mentioned already that um, uh, bacteria can produce neuro neurotransmitters. Uh, there's a great appreciation for that. My colleagues in Cork have uh, uh, created a bacteria that can actually make GABA and, uh, and generate GABA in quite large concentrations in the gut, and we're trying to understand what that could mean. And then Mark Light, in a, in a nice essay a couple of years ago, has summarized that basically all of the key neurotransmitters, GABA, noradrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, are, are being made uh, by different bacterial strains. And therefore, by interfering with the composition of these strains, we can modulate locally what what's going on in terms of these uh, bioactives uh, overall. The last thing I want to talk to you is some recent data that, that, that we've been working on in the context of autism, um, and well, more in the context of social behavior, uh, which we're framing in this autism context, because autism is, is a, a, as you, many of you are aware, a, a, is a, a very prominent in the population uh, and occurs in this four to one male-female ratio. And as I said to you, in our germ-free animals, a lot of the changes that we've found seem to be much more predominant 
in male animals. And so um, we started thinking about whether we would look at some of the behaviors relevant to autism, which would be social interaction, impaired communication, repetitive behaviors. Uh, and um, Leva Debene, a, a postdoc in the lab, ha had experience in this. And uh, so, so we, we started investigating it. But before I go on and show you what we found, it's important to realize that the relationship between gastrointestinal function and autism is quite complex and quite long uh, and very unresolved um, uh, over many decades. But largely, people ha have begun to see that there are changes in, in gut function. But it's, it, it's one of these scenarios where autism, uh, people with autism also have altered diet. And diet is one of the biggest uh, programmers of our microbiota. And so there's, there's lots of, and the studies done to date are relatively small. Some of them signal that there are changes. Um, and, and Sydney Feingold is the greater, greatest uh, pr uh, uh, proponent of uh, a microbial basis for autism in, in terms of that. Uh, perhaps th there may be some um, uh, metabolites from different microbial species that are neuroactive and, and, and changing brain wiring during critical phases. Um, and basically, in terms of, uh, has formed a neuroimmune hypothesis around this. Um, this still needs a lot of uh, validation, and, the, and the, the clinical studies haven't really been done. There's equally a, a quite a large number of studies showing no, no change in the microbial composition in, in, in uh, people with autism. So it's, it, the studies need to be done in, in, in a proper fashion. But um, what Leva in, 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 in our lab wanted to look at was uh, how mice that were growing up germ-free, how do they respond in, in the um, uh, three-chamber test uh, for sociability uh, that's widely used uh, in the autism uh, field. And basically, um, following a, a habituation, there was no difference in habituation in these, in these animals. The, uh, a, a mouse is given the choice of spending time with a, another mouse or, or with a chamber with, that's empty. And then uh, for looking at social cognition, uh, we, we look at whether the mouse will spend some time with a novel mouse, and, and they should, or with a, um, a familiar mouse. And so what we found is that the increase in um, sociability that we find in, in, in a normal mouse uh, is absent in germ-free animals, and very much so in males. Um, and when we put the mouse back, that the social cognition uh, phenotype is also absent. So that there's these deficits in sociability that are in animals that lack completely uh, a microbiota. So it's telling us the microbiota is very important. And what we did then was we, we looked at uh, when we put the micro biota back post weaning, we were able to show that the uh, social preference was able to be reversed. So we were able to get back this social preference. We also, in, 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 the, in the second part of the study, we looked at repetitive grooming, and there was a huge increase in repetitive grooming uh, in germ-free animals. And again, this was reversible uh, following uh, recolonization. However, when we looked at the social cognition, uh, uh, the amount of time spent with a, a familiar versus a novel, uh, that the animals weren't able to discriminate this at all. Uh, and, and this was um, a permanent change. And these are the small studies, but they're really just, just telling us that, that, that uh, the bacteria in your gut uh, during critical phases, especially early in life, are very important for uh, um, uh, the, the correct wiring that's underlying um, sociability. And so we're now working out where in the brain this is, this is occurring and how it's mediating its effects. We're also interested in other aspects of cognition, and Paul Kennedy, a, a student of mine, is doing a lot of work on, in, in humans uh, with different gastrointestinal disorders to see if this brain-gut um, dysfunction is, is, is occurring, and, uh, and we know that stress and pain and immune activation uh, uh, can impact cognition, well then maybe in patients with uh, disordered brain-gut communication there may be also um, changes in cognition, and uh, we're looking at this in functional bowel and inflammatory bowel diseases, and uh, it, it's something that, 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 that's informing a, a lot of our translational work. Uh, at the moment. So just to summarize what, what I've told you is basically that stress, especially in early life, will alter the composition of the microbiota. Uh, the microbiota in, in, in early life is critical for brain development, for sociability, normal behavior, and visceral pain. Um, and that probiotic bacteria can positively affect brain function and behavior, and that maybe the gut microbiome may be a tractable therapeutic target for developing novel uh, psychobiotics. And, and, and uh, uh, but uh, this cartoon came out when we uh, 
published our paper uh, some years ago to, to tell us that you know there's still some gloom in the air and uh, uh, you know uh, we're still a long way uh, away. But in an opinion paper just just out uh, in uh, biological psychiatry, we've we've put this concept forward of psychobiotics as a novel type of psychotropic that can, by different means, modulate the immune system through the vagus nerve, uh, have a direct effect on the brain, or through the enteric nervous system, uh, and can impact on where we're going. Um, but um, we result, results from large-scale placebo control studies are awaited, so it's just a, a proposition right now, but it, it's, it, it's an example of where the field uh, is moving. So we're kind of getting this idea that uh, there is a relationship between microbiota uh, and stress, but the question really is, is, it's a chicken and egg question, uh, does altered microbiota in early life prime for increased susceptibility to stress? Or does stress in early life lead to an altered microbiota, and it's an epiphenomenon epiphenomenological uh, uh, aspect of it. And, and it's really like which came first, and it, it'll take some time really to tease uh, this out. And that's what's going to be informing our work uh, over the next uh, number of years uh, in trying to build this model of that a healthy uh, brain and a healthy gut are very much uh, it's, uh, in tandemly linked. And this intrinsic uh, aspects of both are, are important for maintaining uh, healthy status and pr protecting from the effects of stress uh, and disease. And it, it's uh, kind of what I like to refer to as the Downton Abbey effect, which is basically, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a British TV series where uh, you have uh, all the uh, posh people living upstairs and the servants downstairs and uh, they kind of ignore each other more or less but only when things start going wrong down here and start filtering up to the uh, service upstairs do people really understand that the, 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 they're actually playing a fundamental role in keeping the house in order and uh, so this uh, marriage between the, the, the upstairs in the brain and, and the gut uh, downstairs is very important uh, uh, for where we're going. So I, I, I'd like to this is the work of a lot of people, I won't go into it, but I, I work very closely with Ted Dynan, who's the chair of psychiatry in Cork, uh, in trying to keep um, all, all of our work uh, translational and clinically relevant. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions. Great talk, thank you very much. I was wondering from an evolution perspective, have you been able to track the complexity of the microbiotic um, community or um, with the complexity of the brain, looking at reptiles versus mammals? And people are doing it. People, people are beginning to look at that ac uh, across interspecies type uh, effects and uh, people are also you know, doing microbiota analysis in, in um, zebrafish and, and uh, you know, all the way up. I, I don't know in terms of, you know, I haven't really studied that literature that well in terms of specification. Uh, I know there's a conference on at the moment on evolutionary biology, which the microbiome is really hot uh, on it, uh, and th there's some um, news feeds coming through. But I, 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 th I think it's very much, it would be a very much uh, important driver uh, along the evolution. Uh, what people have looked at is, again, in terms of uh, migration and looked at the microbiome uh, uh, changes across different populations, and it also seems to uh, attract uh, different uh, uh, civil, uh, people in different societies have different microbiomes based on where they came from as well. I was wondering, uh, what effects do the uh, antibiotics in our food supply have on the microbiota? Yeah, this is, this is a, a really important area. Marty Blazer in New York has done a lot of work uh, showing that even trace elements in, in meat in the U.S. Uh, can have really marked effects, especially on the immune system. That's that's where a lot of the work is going on. So that the and he proposes that this inflammation may lead to uh, 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 play a role in the obesity epidemic uh, in the US right now, uh, because uh, it, it's clear that there's a st really strong link between uh, uh, um, obesity and different microbial uh, species. No one's looked at it in behavior yet? Thank you for your interesting talk. Um, 
I wonder what would be your advice to uh, laboratory animal science or people involved in the daily care of our laboratory animals? Should we even more restrict the microbial control of our laboratory animals or should we all move towards conventionally housed animals? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is something that's a, a, a very interesting uh, question because um, for normal, for health, for, if you were talking specifically on a health, the welfare of the animal, you would want to have as diverse in a, of a microbiota as possible. So you would not want, an, you'd want a conventionally housed uh, uh, um, uh, microbiota. And, um, but the, the, the problem is, is when we have these very clean S, but SPF, but they're not, they still have a, a microbiota. So um, the impact of that uh, and the interactions of that with stress are, are, are not trivial. And uh, it, it, it's difficult to, 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 you know, we're forced into this for, for different reasons. Um, I think understanding what will get to a stage where the, the animal suppliers will, will not only providing a health screen, but they'll also eventually be providing a microbial screen uh, of their different parts of the, where they're supplying the animals from so that we can see what's there. Is it a normal microbiota or not? And we'll be asked to maintain it in that, in that way. Um. And one of my studies, I'm addressing the effects of uh, chemotherapy and, and animal models on cognitive performance. Do you know anything about chemotherapy and cancer treatment as, as a cytotoxic uh, substance? What that actually is doing uh, on the uh, uh, gut flora? Um, I have no idea. Uh, um, I, most, th there are uh, a study in, in, that came out in, from um, Turnbach in, in Cell this year, which looked at uh, lots of different pharmacological agents across the whole uh, pharmacopoeia, uh, you know, different types of, uh, uh, and they all can impact uh, the composition of the gut, either directly or indirectly. So I would be surprised if chemotherapeutic agents didn't uh, have uh, that uh, uh, direct effects. Uh, we've worked on antipsychotics, for example, and shown that olanzapine, uh, um, which induces uh, aspects of the metabolic syndrome, also changes quite dramatically uh, the concentrations of bacteria in the gut, and we're looking at that as, as a potential um, intervention for that. But I would imagine most drugs will have some effect. Hi, uh, cheers to the talk, it was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering more about when you were talking about reintroducing the gut microbiota. Yeah. Um, I was more wondering about kind of does developmental kind of reintroduction, at what stage are you talking about reintroducing it? Like, um, are you really reintroducing it at adulthood or No, we're doing just post weaning. Post weaning, oh, post okay, grand, grand. Would you think that's something that, like, that's developmentally, that's in humans, as you're saying, would you have the kind of the idea of reintroduction? Do you wait till young adulthood or do you introduce as soon as possible? Yeah, I, I think that that's a very important question. And it's one, for example, that the infant milk formula companies are very interested in uh, because they would like to supplement an, a, 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 a infant milk formula with uh, uh, agents that would make it m have a beneficial impact. So a lot of uh, companies are now going down this route to try and give it early uh, as well. But, um, you know, it, 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 what we've also shown is that by giving bacteria in adulthood, we're able to also have effects. So it's not, it's not it, there are probably critical windows for certain behaviors to emerge and, and to be reversed. And that's kind of where, where our data is showing right now. Does your diet include a lot of yogurt? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, the, 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 the the problem we have with, the, with understanding the yogurt from the supermarket is none of the, none of the trials have been done uh, to look at the, the beneficial effects of, of it. Um, the other thing you have to um, uh, factor into a lot of the yogurts in, 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 in supermarkets are, have a lot of sugar in them as well, so you, you have to kind of you know, understand that. But uh, I think I I if people were able to show uh, you know, conclusively that there was going to be, that the, all of these da data would transfer and you could get a yogurt with one of the specific bacteria that it was, I definitely would be taking it. Uh, just a quick question about uh, migration of ethnic groups to new areas and mm. new foods and so on and uh, 
what your thoughts are about uh, some of the problems that might be associated yeah. with that. Yeah, I think, I mean, th th this is well studied in gastrointestinal areas, like in inflammatory bowel disease, people have, you know, shown when the Bedouins moved and became, uh, that, that they developed a lot more inflammatory bowel disease, and, and that's probably due to changes in gut flora and inflammation as much as anything else. Um, people are looking at this right now. Jeff Gordon's group in, in, in uh, Wash U and others are, are looking at it, comparing, uh, a, 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 you know, to, to see that, Diet can really be the main thing to impact what you're, uh, what's going on. We did a study, my colleagues in Cork did a study, it's not a migration study, but it's a study in elderly, and it was in Nature last uh, August, where they took um, uh, 200 elderly people and watched them change their, uh, where they lived, from in community into uh, um, rehab or into a residential home and uh, w looked at all aspects of health and followed them up for a two year period. And they showed that the microbiome, w they were able to tell from their microbiome where they were living and they, their frailty status. So, and it was all dictated by, governed by diet. So basically when you're in a residential home, you get the same diet all the time, very, not very diverse. Uh, whereas in your community, you get a diet very rich in, in vegetables and meat. And so, the, so they were able to chart, and it was this middle group in rehab where they went and they were able to look at this. And it was very interesting because it opens up the idea that we, you could create a food. And indeed, Jeff Gordon's group had published in Science this year uh, uh, this very possibility uh, that you get a food that would be help to Govern they or change the microbiota to put you in a better health status. And what Gordon's group did was in, it was in, in a, a malnutrition population in Malawi. Uh, they, they had Kwashi Oker uh, syndrome. He created a food that was able to uh, change the, the microbiota, and that, that was able to help the malnutrition. And, and I think that's where we would see it again, also at migration levels uh, across populations as well. But uh, this is one of the areas where people are quite interested in now is getting um, very uh, custom-based diets that are going to help your create the best microbiota for you during a certain period of your life. I'm afraid we're going to have to close this session, although I'm sure John will Absolutely. entertain Absolutely. more questions either at lunch or this evening in the pub. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please join with me in thanking him for what I think was quite a tour de force. <laughs> <laughs>